Good evening, everybody. It's lovely to see so many people here. Um, so it's good to see that we can still draw a crowd on a day when it never seems to stop raining. Um, and I'm sure we've got our tonight's speaker to thank for that. Um, before I introduce uh, our speaker, uh, just by way of apology, our chair apologises that she can't be with us this evening. She's come down with a very nasty cold, so uh, she's at home with that. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm standing in. Um, anyway, it's very cliche to say this, but uh, here it really does uh, mean something. Tonight's speaker absolutely requires no introduction whatsoever. Um, he's a former president of the Edinburgh Walter Scott Club, which is perhaps one of his greatest achievements uh, we've mentioned, uh, former principal curator of manuscripts at the National Library of Scotland, former curator at the uh, Royal Society of Edinburgh, and he has published uh, enormous quantities of things, um, and I believe quite widely as well. Um, uh, two things uh, I'd want to mention, sort of plugging um, as well. His first COVID book, um, as he calls it, is Frolics in the Face of Europe, which I'm sure many of us in this room have read. Um, uh, an astounding work that really, I think, um, captures, uh, uh, I, I think, a very kind of human relationship Scott had with the continent. Um, and that really, to anyone who hasn't read that, I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it. Um, his second COVID book, um, Old Greeky, um, I think has just just come out, yes, yeah, just come out, and uh, is recommended reading for everyone. Um, uh, you can pop it in a, a, a stocking, I'm sure. Um, and uh, tonight's talk will touch um, on part of the research from that. So it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Ian Gordon-Brown. A glass of good wine is a gracious creature, said Scott. Both the Edinburgh chapter of the Commandery de Bordeaux and the Amicables are having dinners downstairs, so if you want to leave for either now, I ask you only to do so graciously. A preliminary word of warning. I've been quite badly hit by post-COVID health problems, affecting my heart, my vision, my hearing, and by brain fog. So four things might happen tonight. I might have to sit down suddenly. I might not be able to see my script, the screen, or you. I might not hear what you say. And I might forget entirely why I've come here. <laughs> but uh, if you're willing to come with me, let's persevere. Ladies and gentlemen, you hardly need me to remind you tonight that 2021 was the 250th anniversary of the birth of Sir Walter Scott. Even in his own day, Scott came to stand uniquely for Scotland. He brought his country into the literary, historical, topographical, sentimental and romantic consciousness of the world in a way no one had done previously or perhaps has ever done since. Posthumously, he's assumed the mantle of one of the greatest Scotsmen who has ever lived, perhaps the greatest. He deserves his space rocket monument in Princess Street, which stands as a vast Gothic interloper in the heart of the classical new town of Edinburgh. That dichotomy is significant, the romantic versus the classical. Scott's 250th anniversary coincided with the celebration of the bicentenary of the start of the Greek Revolution and the Greek War of Independence. This year, 2022, is the bicentenary of the laying of the foundation stone of the National Monument, Edinburgh's would-be Parthenon on Calton Hill. I thought it would be interesting to investigate what connections can be traced between Scott, the essence of a romantic Scotland, and Greece, a country often likened to Scotland in its landscape and in the character of its people. If Edinburgh, Old Reeky, was Scott's own romantic town, the city had also become, in Scott's lifetime, the modern Athens or the Athens of the North. Scott half mocked half supported the aspiration to turn the one into the other. Well, to be honest, maybe a quarter endorsed and three quarters condemned. 
I have just this month published my study of this phenomenon. Scott figures in it uh, as a slightly puzzled and occasionally querulous observer of a profound but transient change of taste and perception that gave his city the character that I think is best summed up by the new kind epithet, Old Greeky. Students of both Edinburgh traditions and of the early life of Walter Scott may be amused to perpetuate the laboured witticism that Scott was born in the Greek classroom of the university. Some explanation is necessary. The third floor tenement flat in the College Wind, where Walter Scott was born, subsequently disappeared under the rising north elevation of William Henry Playfair's Old College Quadrangle, a very approximate location for the former Scots family dwelling would certainly have been that lecture room. But pleasing though the conceit is, it's hardly an appropriate coincidence. Scott was no Greek scholar. Indeed, in his university days, he was known as the Greek blockhead. As a young scholar, as a young man, Scott himself bore that title insouciantly as a sort of mischievous badge of honour. Because we here are steeped in every aspect of Scott's life and thought, and remain secure in the knowledge that not even an apparent slur can cloud our admiration and affection for our hero, I've boldly taken the phrase as the title of my lecture. If Scott was only a poor, negligent Grecian, and but a moderate Latinist, he did at least acknowledge his personal weakness as a classicist, while at the same time recognising more generally the importance of classical learning. And of your you're finding seats there, are you okay? Okay. Traffic, okay, something Scott didn't have to contend with. Uh, I'll start I'll start that paragraph again just for the benefit of the people that are coming. If I was saying if Scott was only a poor, negligent Grecian and but a moderate Latinist, he did at least acknowledge his personal weakness as a classicist while at the same time recognising more generally the importance of classical learning and of that scholarship which took the ancient world as its focus. In his own day, too, he followed the cause of Greek independence to some limited degree and at the end of his life he found himself poised actually to visit Greek lands and sail Greek waters. Maybe he was not such a Greek blockhead after all. Let us see. Scott's boyhood education was, as he would describe it in his memoirs, otherwise known as the ashes steel fragment of autobiography, irregular and miscellaneous. The progress of his studies was interrupted by periods of illness and country convalescence at Kelso, interspersed with study at the local grammar school there. At the High School of Edinburgh, he followed a curriculum which, as far as he was concerned, included much Latin, but no Greek. The rector, Dr Alexander Adam, was a classical scholar of distinction. Scott did not, as he admitted later, make any great figure, or at least any exertions which I made were desultory and little to be depended on. I glanced like a meteor from one end of the class to the other, and commonly disgusted my kind master as much by negligence and frivolity as I occasionally pleased him by flashes of intellect and talent. Scott said that he studied the, his themes in the classics, but not classically, an interesting qualification. He just did not possess a classical mindset. He described his classical studies as being akin to gathering grapes from thistles. His real interests lay elsewhere, for he had a head on fire for chivalry and for earlier English poetry and old Scots ballads, subject that he would describe as the Delilahs of my imagination. Anyone who knows anything about Walter Scott would think first and foremost of a man immersed in medieval chivalry and later romance, not in classical history and legend. Lines from two of the dedicatory epistles prefacing different cantos of Marmion, 1808, epitomised Scott's unclassical literary creed. First, from me thus nurtured dost thou ask the classic poet's well-conned task? And second, cease then, my friend, a moment cease, 
and leave these classic tomes in peace. Of Roman and of Grecian law, sure mortal brain can hold no more. And yet, even in these very epistles, classical allusion was not absent, indicating the vast range of Scott's reading. Certainly, he may have preferred the world of later chivalry and romance, but he undoubtedly found elements of both in the literature and mythology of the classical world, which he affected to eschew. Greek was a necessary course element for any boy intending to take a degree at the University of Edinburgh. Scott immediately found himself at a disadvantage. Because of his fractured education, he'd acquired no Greek at all, not even at an elementary level. His perceived inferiority to his fellow students who sat under Professor Andrew DL was come to terms with and passed off in a regrettable way. He affected to hold Greek in contempt and resolved not to learn it. Scott reveled in the opprobrium of that Greek blockhead, Subriquet, and bore it with perverse pride. For the professor, he wrote a compare and contrast essay in favour of Ariosto and very much against Homer. In a reversal of fortunes that doubtless pleased both parties, D.L., who once damned Scott as a dunce, lived long enough to see his people the published and successful author. Illness again interrupted Scott's studies. He claimed to have forgotten in this interval even the letters of the Greek alphabet, a loss, as he would confess, never to be repaired, considering what that language is and who they were who employed it in their compositions. Lockhart testified to his father-in-law's ignorance of the Greek alphabet in 1830, when he was at a loss to write even Greek words connected with poets and poetry, and Lockhart had to insert them into Scott's manuscript. There are other instances where a friend supplied the Greek tag or citation which Scott himself was unable to contribute, in one text or another, to a passage of text. As in other aspects of life, Scott was at least clear-eyed about what he should know or what he ought to do. His classical learning, as with other studies, neglected in favour of the miscellaneous reading that did set him on fire, was flimsy and inaccurate, leaving him pinched and hampered by his own ignorance. Andrew Diel taught not just the language, but also lectured on Greek history and antiquities, philosophy, literature, and even art. All of this, Scott probably absorbed more subliminally than he admitted. In Paris, in 1815, he was to meet and keep company with the antiquary Jean-Baptiste Le Chevalier, who had spent six months in Edinburgh in 1790-91 to and had read papers to the Royal Society on the topography of Troy. These were translated for the Society by Diel and published not only in the Society's transactions, but as a related monograph. If Scott encountered these works on publication, they would surely have provided his first acquaintance with the Aegean and Asia Minor in antiquity and with the site of Troy, subjects he later took up with his great friend J.B.S. Morris. At some stage, a copy of James Dalloway's Constantinople Ancient and Modern, with excursions to the shores and islands of the archipelago and to the Troad, London 1797, inscribed to D.L. by the author, ended up in Scott's library. Scott drew on it for topographical information at the end of his life when writing his novel Count Robert of Paris, which has a Byzantine setting. In this late novel, Homeric reference and allusion is not uncommon. Despite his youthful bravado, Scott himself, no mean writer of epic, epic verse, in fact had a healthy and enduring respect for Homer. He had a vicarious interest in what might loosely be called contemporary homelic scholarship in that he knew or knew of several of the major players in the game. Scott himself regarded Homer as much as an historian as a poet. In the preface to his poem The Bridal of Triermain, 1813, the preface seems but tangential to a romance about King Arthur, an enchanted castle and a maiden asleep for half a millennium, and on a page adorned with Greek quotations that must have been supplied to him and inserted by another hand, Scott argued that the siege of Troy 
was not the most appropriate subject for poetry, but that Homer's purpose was really to write the early history of his country. Scott, as devotee of the history of warfare and heroism in particular, should indeed have been a great admirer of Homer and his song. And so he was. In 1815, when writing his pseudonymous Paul's letters to his kinsfolk on his visit to the battlefield of Waterloo and his subsequent weeks in Paris, Scott wanted to add a Homeric quotation that he recalled as apposite to the death of a French general after the battle at the hand of a black Brunswick hussar. Scott wrote thus to his Edinburgh legal friend, William Erskine. I have a boon to ask of your learning. You know I'm no Grecian, but I want to quote the original of Homer upon an occasion you will find on page 291 of Paul's letters, then in proof. The line occurs where Achilles is entreated by some poor devil, a son of Priam, if I, rec I recollect right, in his first carnage after Patroclus's death. Scott means Laocon, uh, uh, Lycaon. Will you mark it? in very legible Greek characters on a separate slip of paper and enclose it to me. Scott needed the quotation for a passage in letter eight of his book to add colour and pathos to his account of the death of General Duhaime, an incident that, as Scott suggested, had something in it which was Homeric. The French officer had begged quarter of the German. The latter regarded him sternly with his sabre uplifted and then briefly saying the Duke of Brunswick died yesterday bestowed on him his death's wound. Scott printed in Greek the line from Iliad 21 line 107 Patroclus also died and he was better far than you. Scott indulged often in a form of whimsical self-deprecation when dealing with classical scholars. The oft-repeated assertions that he was no Grecian or entirely ignorant of that noble language was regularly matched by expressions of sheepish regret, shame even, about lack of classical knowledge. These remain characteristic of Scott to the end of his life, albeit frequently masked by a kind of insouciance that led him to make light of or the best of his situation. He once penned a long verse letter to Lockhart that contained a couplet in which he displayed characteristic disregard for the pedantry all too often associated with minutiae of classical scholarship. For my back is as broad and as hard as Ben Lomans, and I treat as I please both the Greeks and the Romans. A present from an old friend in 1824 afforded Scott not just pleasure at receiving a work of art evocative, however tenuously, of classical antiquity, but allowed him to indulge in his customary self-deprecation where classics and the ancient world were concerned. Mrs Hughes of Uffington gave Scott what she called a head of palace enamelled and copper, a curious antique. The recipient saw the opportunity for some heavy humour at his own expense. I should feel in despair at the idea of robbing you of, of your palace, but that Dr. Hughes, Thomas, her clergyman husband, can so well spare wisdom or its prototype, and that I, on the other hand, would so much be obliged to anyone to improve the slender stock which nature has given me, and should therefore make Minerva the goddess of my private chapel. What is referred to here is a circular Limoges enamel plaque of the head of palace set in a bronze mount. Mannerist in style, the portrait bears no obvious iconographic similarity to heads of Athena of established type. It lacks helmet, spear or aegis. Scott found for it a location more suitable than that he had first suggested. I owe you a thousand acknowledgments for Pallas, who arrived as if steered by her own superior intelligence in the most perfect safety. It seems a very great curiosity and has been admired as a piece of art by Wilkie and other good judges. I have hung it over the chimney of the literal armoury, where surrounded by all manner of military implements, Minerva has the appearance of being quite in character, and where also her metallic frame corresponds in great effect to the different weapons with which she is associated. 
Also in 1824, the publisher Archibald Constable had presented Scott with a magnificent and comprehensive collection of the best editions of the Greek and Latin authors by way of inauguration gift on the occasion of the completion of the new library at Abbotsford. Delighted, honoured and flattered, but also perhaps slightly embarrassed, Scott, admitting that he was not very worthy of the present, thanked the donor profusely while offering this confession and assurance. Who knows what ideas the classics may suggest, for I am determined to shake off the rust which years has contracted and to read at least some of the most capital of the ancients before I die. The collection set him up in the line of classical antiquities, and he noted in his house catalogue the so-called reliquiae trotcosienses, this was his donation that this was the donation that caused Scott to borrow and apply to himself the lines of Thomas Wharton for long enamoured of a barbarous age, a faithless truant to the classic page. In 1820, Scott's younger son Charles was sent to the Reverend John Williams's school in Lampeter, mm. Wales. The boy received a letter from his father encouraging application to his Greek and Latin grammar. A perfect knowledge of the classical languages, the elder Scott wrote, has been fixed upon and not without good reason as the mark of a well-educated young man. And although many people may have scrambled into distinction without it, it is always with the greatest difficulty, just like climbing over a wall instead of giving your ticket at the door. If you are not a well-founded grammatical scholar in Greek and Latin, you will in vain present other qualifications to distinction. John Williams came north in 1824 to be the first rector of the new Edinburgh Academy, at the opening of which establishment Scott gave the address. Scotland had not produced many eminent classical scholars, he conceded. The teaching of Greek must begin earlier and had to be prosecuted to a greater extent than hitherto. Mating a direct comparison or identification with Greece, this was a new school in the modern Athens after all, Scott enthused about the Academy's pupils being taught to venerate the patriots and heroes of Scotland along with those of Greece. The name of Bruce was matched with that of Themistocles, those of Flodden and Bannockburn with Plataea and Marathon. Greek, he said, was the language of the fathers of history and of a people whose martial achievements and noble deeds were the ornament of their pages. In 1793, Scott had written to a friend encouraging him to visit Kelso and offering to be his cicerone in the Scottish borders. Patrick Murray had travelled widely, but Scott felt no embarrassment or inferiority in being able to show him only the domestic antiquities of the district, which he felt should appeal to Murray's picturesque turn. Scott then used a Greek word meaning the right or the noble, but inscribed it in English characters. I believe, he said, with respect to the real Tokalon, his border villages and border rivers would yield to none in the world, nor do I fear that even in your eyes, which have been feasted on classic ground, they will greatly sink in comparison. For antiquities, it is true, we have got no temples or heathenish fanes to show, but as substantial old castles and ruined abbeys will serve in their stead, they are to be found in abundance. For Scott, himself untravelled, classical landscapes rich in topographical interest and literary association, such as contemporary grand tourists might have enjoyed in Italy or even in Greece, were at his border's doorstep and they were, in his opinion, however limited and untested by experience of anything else, just as good. In his verse and prose, Scott would go on to do a similar service to the central highlands of Scotland. It was his achievement to persuade a generation to share his view in an age when the continent was effectively closed to travel because of the long wars of France. Scotland became classic ground of a particular sort. John Morritt, classical scholar and leading member of the Society of Dilettanti, came to stay with Scott at Ashesteel in 88. And this is what you wore if you were high up in the ranks of the dilettanti. Marvellous. <laughs> Grecian taste and Roman spirit was their famous toast. 
Describing the visit to Lady Abercorn, Scott explained that Morritt was deep in Grecian law, which led him some years ago to visit the very ground where Troy Town stood. I showed him all the remarkables in our neighbourhood and told him a story for every cairn. Other correspondents were likewise briefed on Morritt's border raid. Morris had engaged Scott in my hobby horse at office of exhibiting the ruins of Melrose Abbey and some of the other wonders of our wilds, seasoned with many tales of feud and legendary wonder. It could have been the money. The gentleman, that is Morritt, wandered all over Greece and visited the Troad. His erudition is not, however, of an overbearing kind, which is lucky for me, who am but a slender classical scholar. For his part, and by way of reciprocation, Morritt told Scott about Greece, for example, of the so-called treasure of Atreus at Mycenae. Scott lost no opportunity to draw the somewhat tenuous architectural parallel between this beehive tomb and the brochs in the Scottish Highlands and Islands, buildings of stone laid in overlapping horizontal courses. It was characteristic of Scott to turn everything to Scotland. He found pleasure in his own classic ground. In Peter's letters to his kinsfolk, J.G. Lockett has the fictional Welsh visitor, Dr. Peter Morris, report that Scott had told him he was treading on classic ground. In other words, the landscape of the traditional law Scott himself embodied in his minstrelsy of the Scottish border, in which he would subsequently evoke in a series of narrative poems and later in his historical novels. And yet, Scott knew inwardly that by remaining fixed on and devoted to Scotland, he was missing out on something else the chance to see what so many others wanted to see, namely real classic ground. In 1812, he admitted to Lord Byron, whom he hoped might pay him a visit, that the ruins of Melrose have little to tempt one who has seen those of Athens, and went on to make a confession, disarming in its honesty and striking in its sense of wistfulness for wider shores. As for me, I would rather cross-question your Lordship about the outside of Parnassus than learn the nature of the contents of all the other mountains in the world. With a silent reference to Bert Byron's Child Harold's Pilgrimage, Canto I, uh, and also an allusion to the transfer to Britain of the Elgin marbles, Scott continued wistfully, Pray, when did you hear anything of the celebrated Pegasus? Some say he has, brought, he has been brought off with other curiosities to Britain. Much of Scott's occasional allusion to matters relating to the wider realm of classical scholarship with either whimsical and mockingly, mockingly self-deprecating or else surprisingly knowledgeable. Certainly, he might facetiously suggest to the formidably learned young Cambridge classical prizeman James Bailey that he had merely the brain of a half leopard goth, but at the same time he could display his own wide knowledge through the interest he showed in Bailey's philological work, despite all the while purporting to write himself off as one of the unlearned, with inconsequential opinions to match this speciously demeaning judgment. The same long letter evinces great sympathy with Bailey's scholarship. The lengthy correspondence with Bailey demonstrates that Scott was not nearly so ignorant of classical literature, its history and its criticism as his dismissive comments on his own indifferent abilities might suggest. If Byron never came to Scott at Abbotsford to tell him about the numerous <coughs> slopes of Parnassus or Helicon, he did at least send Scott in 1815 a genuine and most affecting material relic of Greek antiquity. Like the old heroes in Homer, we exchange <coughs> gifts. Byron sent me a large sepulchral vase of silver. It was full of dead men's bones and had inscriptions on two sides of the base. One ran this. The bones contained in this urn were found in certain ancient sepulchres within the long walls of Athens. Byron's urn took, place, took pride of place in the library at Abbotsford, Scott having commissioned for it from George Bullock a stand of exceptional design and of idiosyncratic classical inspiration. The next year, Scott vouch first vouchsafed his intention, someday, to assume the mantle of the grand tourists that inwardly he knew that he should become before it was too late. I have serious thought, while I still have strong health and active spirits, to visit 
the classical scenes of Italy and perhaps of Greece. Nothing, he told another friend, gives such a fillip to the imagination as going abroad. And I fully intend the next year, while I still have health and strength for such frolics, to take a little frisk as far as Rome and Naples, perhaps as far as Athens. Contemporary writers such as Charlotte Eaton and Constantine Phipps, Lord Normanby, produced works of a rather peculiar genre that presented a factual travel narrative within a fictional framework. Odd though this kind of writing was, Scott admired Normanby's, Normanby's The English in Italy. These works stressed the considerable leap in ambition that a visit to Greece entailed. Travellers who ventured to Greece were deftly cut above mere tourists who contented themselves with the well-worn roads to Italy. Lord Normanby likened travellers to Greece to field officers, whereas tourists on the old Grand Tour itinerary of Italy were merely subalterns. Modern scholarship has likewise emphasised this increase in travelling aspiration, enlargement of vision and widening of horizons. As Robert Holland has well put it, going to Greece called for a mental as much as a physical leap over and beyond any visit to Italy. For the generation of Scots maturity, Byron of course led the way and provided both a route and an ideal to emulate in greater or lesser part and a romantic approach to travel that was at once more individual and less deferential to the old tradition of the veneration of classical antiquity. In his The Philhellenes, C.M. Woodhouse declared that Walter Scott was barely lukewarm towards the Greeks, but cited no evidence to support this statement. I'd like to look at the question of whether Scott could be called a Philhellene, or more generally, at his vision of Greece and at the effect, if any, of what might be termed the call of Greece had on him. Scott reviewed the third canto of Byron's Child Harold in 1816. It's difficult not to see a glimmer of rising Philhellenism in this passage. Greece, the cradle of poetry with which our earliest studies are familiar, was presented to us along with her ruins and her sorrows. A delightful scenery, once dedicated to those deities who, though dethroned from their own Olympus, still preserve a poetical empire, varied by all the moral effect derived from what Greece is and what she has been. For it was, was doubled by comparisons between the philosophers and heroes who formerly inhabited that romantic country and their descendants, who either stooped to their Scythian conquerors or maintained among the recesses of their classical mountains an independence as wild and savage as it is precarious. Pictures fade and statues moulder and temples decay and cities perish, but the sod of Marathon is immortal and he who has trod it has identified himself with Athenian story in a manner which neither painter, nor poet, nor sculptor could have accomplished for him. The spell of the past is manifest, and nascent admiration for the Greece of the present may be sensed. Reviewing the fourth canto of Child Harold two years later, Scott was again open in his praise of the country whose sun so long set has yet left on the horizon of the world such a blaze of splendour. Then in 1819, Greece was once more the focus of Scott's tribute and paid indeed in terms rather similar. That wonderful country whose days of glory have left such a never dying blaze of radiance behind them. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to sit down for a moment. Do forgive me. I'm sorry, this is what happens to me all the time at the moment. Sorry. Things have really been quite bad. Uh, where was I? Uh, but not all contemporary writers on Greek themes appeal to him. Sidney Owenson's Woman or Ida of Athens, a four volume novel of 188, was a work Scott was assumed to have reviewed unfavorably in the quarterly. He didn't in fact do so, and he'd made it clear that he hadn't even read the novel itself in the first place, or even the review of the work by hand that wasn't his. A pity, 
Miss Owenson had thought of the contrast between the great heroic past of Greece and the suffering present of the oppressed Greeks as ideal material for fashioning a modern novel. The recollection of what it was once and the consideration of what it is now, her description of the Ottoman conquest and occupation was most affecting. Dark was the cloud from which that moment hung its impenetrable veil over the faded luster of one of the most renowned and glorious nations of the earth. The Greeks, who resemble their beautiful statues, which though injured, defaced and mutilated, still preserve the exquisite traits and delicate touches of supreme genius. The Greeks, who are openly debased because they are no longer free. Scott had friends who might be described as Philhellenes. Byron was, of course, the most notable and chief among these. The death of Byron, Lady Abercorn suggested to Scott, was a sad blow for the Greek cause, for which I am most anxious. The same year, Scott himself was moved to acknowledge that same cause. The press report of his address at the opening of the Edinburgh Academy included the following passage. At no moment was the study of that beautiful language, Greek, so interesting as at present, when the people among whom it is still in use were again, as he trusted, about to emancipate themselves from slavery and barbarism and take their rank among free nations. But to counter these sentiments is the journal entry for the 8th of September 1826. Scott had been talking to Sir Frederick Adam, High Commissioner for the Ionian Islands, when Adam was home on leave. And here is Sir Frederick Adam and his monument in Corfu time, town standing in front of the palace of St Michael and St George, because of course it is there that the, uh, the British uh, order for diplomatic and foreign service was first conceived. Scott said of Adam, he deeply regrets the present war as premature, undertaken before knowledge and rational education had extended themselves sufficiently. The neighbourhood of the Ionian Islands was fast producing civilization, and as knowledge is power, it is clear that the example of Europeans and the opportunities of education afforded by the Ionian Islands must soon give them an immense superiority over the Turk. This premature wall war has thrown all back into a state of barbarism. In 20 or 30 years, the superiority of the Greeks in intelligence and cultivated talent must have rendered them greatly superior to the Turk, and it could not have happened that they should have remained long in subjection. When the next year Scott read of the Battle of Navarino, he was pleased to know that we have thumped the Turks very well, but was dubious about the legality of the Allied interference. What constituted the legitimacy of either side's action, and how might the British feel if, say, an Ottoman fleet had sailed into an Irish bay in support of a putative Catholic insurrection? But when, somewhat later, he wrote the new introduction to his novel The Talisman in its revised version for the magnum opus edition, taking the opportunity uh, in doing so to point out how a British traveller's vision of the world had expanded beyond the conspectus of the traditional Grand Tour. He wrote of Greece as so attractive by the remains of its art, by its struggles for freedom against the Mohammedan tyrant, and by its very name, where every fountain has its classical legend. <clears throat> In the years around 1820, just at the time when the notion of Edinburgh as the Athens of the North was approaching its zenith, Scott's knowledge of the topography of the real Greece was increasing. Uh, and with it, it's his vision of the country both ancient and modern. The artist and travel writer Hugh William Williams held two significant exhibitions of his work in Edinburgh in 1822 and 1826, and these shows were influential. A large number of the watercolours displayed then were of Greek views. Williams is extremely important <coughs> for having promoted the notion of the physical similarities between Edinburgh and Athens, and thus in establishing the concept of Edinburgh as the modern Athens. Not unnaturally, Williams also drew Scottish scenery, including the frontispiece of Hermitage Castle for Scots minstrelsy of the Scottish border in 1802. Critics drew parallels between his portrayal of the Scottish and the Greek landscape. Scott wrote of Williams as the Grecian, even when the context was entirely that of his recording of border antiquities. 
There exists on the screen now a particularly appealing illustrated letter in which Williams captured on one small page two classical localities, especially Scott's, close to Scott's heart, Melrose Abbey, of course, and Abbotsford uh, at the top. <coughs> An idiosyncratic picture of Greece is presented to the reader who has the patience to wade through the prolix, diffuse and downright complicated prefatory letter to Scott's novel Piverell of the Peak of 1822. The imagery here is surely influenced by contemporary picturesque images of Greek sites and it presents a view as if reflected in an artist's clawed glass or seen through the lens of a camera lucida. This introductory verbiage is prefacing uh, a very English novel set in Derbyshire and the Isle of Man in the 1670s is a most unlikely context in which to find Scott's vision of the changing flow of history as reflected in the architectural palimpsest of a ruined and time-altered Greek temple. Dr Jonas Dryasdust of York writes to Captain Clutterbuck at Kenaware, literally I don't know where, in Scotland. Eccentricity looms large. The author of Waverley, Scott himself, of course, is introduced through the medium of an imagined conversation. Dr. Dryersdust takes the author of Waverley to task for those aberrations which is so often your pleasure to make from the path of true history. Scott's own accustomed method of the construction of a romance, a fictitious narrative founded upon history. <coughs> is likened metaphorically by Dryasdust to the inconsistency of a foundation of one period and the superstructure of a later age reared upon it. Just as every classical traveller pours forth expressions of sorrow and indignation when in travelling through Greece he chances to see a Turkish kiosk rising on the ruins of an ancient temple. To this the author of Waverley responds, but since we cannot rebuild the temple a kiosk may be a pretty thing, may it not? Not quite correct in architecture, strictly and classically criticised, but presenting something uncommon to the eye and something fantastic to the imagination on which the spectator gazes with pleasure of the same description which arises from the perusal of an Eastern tale. The archaeological sites of Greece and Italy, uh, of Greece, were likely to have appealed to Scott in the event that he should ever have been able to see them in person, specifically because of the march of history and of the vicissitude which such buildings represent in their decay and their very survival. <clears throat> Scott's late novel, Count Robert of Paris, set in Constantinople, further suggests that he would have appreciated the notion of architectural palimpsests, perhaps rather more than the purity of unsullied Greek buildings. There's a notable passage where the barbed comment may be indicative of the author's more general views of the Greek achievement at its widest. As so often, these views are paradoxical and they oscillate between positive and negative. Of the Golden Gate of the city of Constantinople, it is said by the narrator that the epithet is not so lightly dis dis bespowed, that the epithet... I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to sit down. I do apologise, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. We have a doctor here, don't worry. Refusing any sort of... Of the Golden Gate of the city of Constantinople, it is said by the narrator that the epithet is not so lightly bestowed as may be expected from the inflated language of the Greeks, which throws such an appearance of exaggeration about them, their buildings and monuments. <clears throat> the pleasing epithet, Many Billowed Hellespont, which forms the very last words of the second volume of the novel, is unique in Scott's usage. It feels Homeric. An encounter of a rather different kind will have fixed Greek lands in Scott's imagination. This was his meeting with Diamantina Palatiano, the Corfiot wife of Sir Frederick Adam. As High Commissioner of the Ionian Islands, Adam had met and eventually married a woman whose name suggests she was in fact of Italian, presumably Venetian ancestry. But this is not to alter the fact that she was somewhat of an exotic in Scott's eye, and she was Greek enough for him. He records meeting her at Blair Adam, the Adam family's seat in Kinrosha, 
a beautiful woman whose countenance realises all the poetic dreams of Byron. There is certainly something of full maturity of beauty which seems framed to be adoring and adorned, and it is to be found in the full dark eye, luxuriant tresses and rich complexion of Greece, and not among the pale unripened beauties of the North. What sort of mind this exquisite casket contains is not so easily known. She is anxious to please, and with her striking beauty cannot fail to succeed. The great unknown, smitten by the maid of Athens. A portrait of Blair Adam uh, confirms the reason for Scott's admiration. And here I should say that when Hugh Lockett, sitting in the front, and I were at a reconstruction of the Blair Adam Club at, with our friend uh, Keith Adam at Blair Adam last year, I spotted this portrait on a stair at Blair Adam, and the Laird of Blair Adam didn't actually know who she was. I maintain this is in fact uh, Lady, Lady Adam, uh, although as we'll see there are other portraits and she may have changed through time, but, but we'll see. Anyway, this is, I think, the lovely uh, uh, Diamantia. Her appearance hardly warrants the outrageous comment by Private William Wheeler, that remarkable literary product of the British Army's other ranks, who served in the Ionian Islands at the period of Adams' administration. In 1823, Wheeler indulged in scurrilous gossip about Sir Frederick, alleged breaking up of Diamantina's previous marriage. The High Commissioner, said Wheeler, had been caught in such a situation with a lady that it left no doubt in the mind of her Greek Lord that Sir F had just been measuring him for an enormous pair of horns, which everyone knows is a disagreeable appendage to one's brows, particularly in a warm climate. And he went on to suggest, highly ungallantly, of Diamantina herself, that the beard on her upper lip would ornament an hussar. <laughs> well, I think that is rather unfortunate. These are other portraits of Blair Adam. She may have changed a little. And this is a double portrait in Corfu. Sir Frederick there, interestingly, for those who are interested in orders and decorations, wearing the, or the, the ribbon of the bath, uh, going the right way, and the ribbon of the Order of St. Michael George, crossing it. Uh, now, I think I'm getting very tired, and I may have to cut a little bit here. I was going to talk about Scott in Paris seeing Greek art in the Louvre, and uh, I will go on to say that Scott was very anxious that the British, after the Napoleonic Wars, didn't help themselves to any of the loot from Paris. Uh, he thought that would injure, add injury, uh, insult to injury. Napoleon had himself been rapacious in his looting of Europe. He thought that uh, neither by purchase or gift or otherwise should Britain possess itself of these spoils. Uh, and he reckoned that there was one person in Britain who would greatly uh, share his, his view, and I think this may be a cryptic allusion to uh, Lord Elgin, who was even then negotiating the sale of the Parthenon sculptures to the British government. Uh, in 1818, Scott told Matthew Weld Hartstom, I do not at all grudge the chastisement that Elgin has received, for though I am glad that the marbles are brought here, yet I would not have cut my own hand off rather than have displaced one of them. When Scott met the Corfiot Lady Adam, it was after his elder son, Walter, an army officer, had been considering a possible posting to Corfu on Sir Frederick's staff, and Walter Scott had been lobbying uh, with the Adam family and uh, pulling strings. Uh, he hoped that this would be an agreeable situation for Walter. But hopes were precipitate, and Scott began to think that uh, the younger Scott would have to spend rather more time with his regiment before you could get off to Corfu. The notion of a posting there surfaced again in 1826 when Scott was recorded that his son was once again talking of a posting to the Ionian Islands. Uh, but he began to worry uh, about this separation. He said, it is an awful distance. But the idea of joining Sir Frederick's staff occurred again in 1829 when Captain Scott was unwell. It seemed that a period or two on the military establishment of the High Commissioner uh, would be, uh, in an excellent climate, would be an attractive possibility. 
And so the lobbying of the Adam family began again, uh, and uh, it was thought that the Corfu would be a very comfortable billet for Walter, but nothing happened of that. But nevertheless, I think the idea of Corfu as a place of sanctuary and peace and health in an enviable climate may have remained with the elder Scott and was to rise to the top of his consciousness again in 1832. That year, of course, saw Scott in Italy. He'd been forced to uh, stop work and go south for his health. And his uh, Cicerone in Naples was Sir William Gell, the great classical uh, <coughs> scholar and topographer. And it was under Gell's guidance that Scott would encounter antiquity at first hand and visit inter alia the Greek sites of Paestum and Cumae. He was in the world of Magna Graecia and in the realm of ancient Greek culture in the West. He assured Lockett, a classicist, that he would really like this country extremely. You cannot tread on it, but you set your foot upon some ancient history. Scott was perhaps not so completely unmoved or uninterested in classical antiquity and its vestiges as Gell insisted he was. As when a young man, Scott possibly went out of his way to a fact lack of interest in or respect for the ancients. He told Gell that Moritz and others had frequently tried to drive classical antiquities into his head, but they always found his skull too thick. However, it's undeniably a distinctive feature of Scott's time in the Mediterranean that whatever he saw was compared unfavourably with Scotland. A lake or a hill might put him in mind of home or provoke the outpouring of some snatch of Scott's verse or ballad and stimulate some thought of Jacobite history or tradition. Apart from the ruins of Cumae and the other sites of the Phlegrean fields, the only actual Greek building Scott ever saw were the temples of Paestum. He was as impressed as any essentially non-classically minded man could be, describing them as particularly <coughs> worth the while wonders. Pillars to which any that I ever saw are like pipe staples, that's clay, paste, clay, clay pipe stems in point of size, and scarce any other imperfect than in being roofless. Nothing I have yet seen so much reality about them. Surely they stood in mockery of the Greek revival buildings of his own Athens of the North. But there was no doubt that it was back in Edinburgh and even more at Abbotsford that Scott would rather have been. Uh, to that extent, Gell was right in his withering assessment that Scott cared little for Greece and Rome and that he would never have become classical had he even resided in Greece. I think, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have to take an extra five minutes, but bear with me. The end is in sight. And more to the point, wine and canopies await you. So keep going. I will. I'll not fall down, I promise. But undeniably, I am extremely tired. I'm sorry. In Naples, Scott indeed conceived the notion of actually going on to Greece. The first plan was that Sir Frederick Adam would send his steamboat to Naples to bring him to Corfu. Uh, then Vice Admiral Sir Henry Hotham, uh, Commander-in-Chief in the Mediterranean, became interested in assisting his great compatriot. There was a proposal to provide transport from Naples in a Royal Navy warship. No less a figure than Captain Sir John Franklin, the explorer, might carry Scott in HMS Rainbow first to Corfu and to some of the other Ionian islands and then perhaps round the Peloponnese into the Aegean. Enthusiastically, Scott spoke of visiting Corinth, Athens, Rhodes and any part of Greece uh, I might want with uh, great content ease and safety. He might even go on to Stamboul and on again to Sicily with its great deep temple ruins. Uh, behind all these ideas were that Scott most improbably might be able to write what he sometimes fantasised might be a six volume collection of further travel letters. I mean obviously he couldn't possibly have done that but it was a dream. Uh, it would have been in all likelihood his final literary enterprise. A curious and previously unknown interest developed in Scott's mind in relation to the Ionian Islands. Three letters of Scott to Lockett, to William Laidlaw, his factor at Abbotsford, and to his publisher Robert Caddell give a garbled story, but it's one that with research is intelligible. Somehow news had reached Scott about tree planting and land improvement in the Ionian Islands. 
These were subjects of great interest to Scott as a countryman. Scott almost certainly thought this related to Corfu. In fact, it must be connected with Kithera, Kerigo, or more probably with Lefkada. His informant was Captain John MacPhail, British resident in Santa Maura. MacPhail had apparently given Scott, by some means or other, what Scott described as an interesting account of his, MacPhail's, insular parliament having adopted a national resolution of planting on a large scale upon the argument of the laird of Dumby Dykes to his son. Be I sticking in a tree, Jock, I stick in a tree, it will be growing when you're sleeping. The Hellenes burst into a shout like that of crusaders crying out, it is the truth of God, it is the truth of God, and the plantation amounting to 10,000 hardwood plants is flourishing most capitally. To Laidlaw, Scott wrote in delight that the Greeks have adopted our Abbotsford kind of planting and of how he had heard that the trees grow without culture in this happy clime without manure of any kind. Due to the pretty proverb of Dumby Dykes, the plantation was already making a noble figure in the finest soil in the world. MacPhail, a Scotsman of course, was noted for his zeal for agricultural improvement, first in Kithera and then in Lifkada. Evidently, he'd sought to quote the apothem tree planting from the heart of Midlothian as inspiration to the assembly members on his island. Sir William Gill informed the Society of Dilettanti in February 17, in 1832 that Scott thinks he is now going to Greece, which, considering how little he cares, is certainly not worth the trouble to him. But he seems to like sailing, and so Greece is very well for that in a good king's ship. But by mid-March, Gill reported again in much less positive terms. I hope I shall praise, persuade him not to go to Greece, for which he is quite unprepared, to take any interest and for which his health is quite unequal. The fact that it is, uh, though he is very well and much better since he has been here, a case might arise when he might be lost in a few minutes for want of a doctor, and we have a doctor, uh, he might be lost for want of a doctor, which if he will go, uh, I very much hope he will take with him. One has a notion of Scott as some sort of proto-Hellenic cruise passenger content to sail among the Aegean islands in comfort and some luxury wherever the ship might take him with medical care on hand. But Scott did, in fact, have one possible destination in view beyond all others. Gell's report to the dilettante stated that he has an idea of a poem on roads, but as I go about a good deal with him and observe how he sees things, I can tell him more about roads than he will ever learn if he ever goes, and I'm now making him a little collection of notes, sketches and hints, which I trust will render the voyage useless, Gill means unnecessary. In his reminiscences of Scott's time in Italy, Gill recorded that he'd become extremely curious about Rhodes, and that the island had become an object of great importance to him as putative setting for the new narrative poem he was planning. This would have been a most interesting turn in Scott's literary career, for he had long since abandoned the verse epic for the prose novel, Greece and the Aegean might have seen him return to the literary form uh, with which he had first sprung to fame. He'd been interested in Rhodes since childhood, when he devoured the Abbe de Verto's history of the Knights of St John, sometime of Rhodes, and latterly of Malta. But Scott didn't appreciate how far Rhodes lay from Corfu. In the end, circumstances were against him. And he conceded that, as he put it, my vision of Rhodes goes to the devil, which is a great pity. Gell was left to furnish him with drawings and various notes, which he described as as much topography as was necessary, and indeed more information with regard to that island than in the existing state of his infirmities he could have collected himself on the spot. There were other reasons why Gell may have thought it unwise for Scott not to venture into Greek waters. These may even have transcended what he perceived as his friend's inability to make the best of personal recollection of the sights and Scott's uncertain state of health. This was the state of health of Greece itself. In a forceful riposte against growing philhellenic sentiment, Gell had demonstrated his scepticism as to the likely success of the Greek uprising. In no way can I foresee much profit to the people of Greece who may change masters and exist, but can never exist without a master, for they will destroy each other. 
and he had continued with a cynical, rather depressing conclusion to his narrative of a voyage in the Maria, that the joys of liberty were too violent. Revolution was by no means a harmless recreation, to be prosecuted or relinquished like a philosophical experiment. Grecian liberty, I hold, to be a thing quite unattainable in the present day. Gell will not have wanted his friend to risk any too close an encounter with truculent Greeks fighting other Greeks. In 1832, the situation in Greece was neither good nor conducive to a visit by a frail tourist like Scott. Throughout all his modest history of continental travelling, Scott had shown himself to be no Byron. In writing to Robert Caddell of the promised peep at Greece, Scott confided that the country was in great confusion, while at the same time assuring his rapacious publisher, whose greatest commercial asset by far Scott was, that it is little I care for it that I do not mean to expose myself to the least danger. For his part, Sir Frederick Adam hoped that events in Greece would have assumed a more quiet aspect, for in truth the accounts of the state of that country scarce were, of, were such as would have made me more than doubt the prudence of anybody going there for pleasure and gratification of curiosity. Nevertheless, Adam still spoke of Scott's coming to Corfu at the season of our greatest beauty, and that he might go on to Greece to see the country also at just the most propitious moment, before the heats are inconvenient and when I hope the political heats will have subsided owing to the appointment of the sovereign, allowing Scott freedom to see whatever he desired. The illusion, of course, was to the Bavarian implant on the throne of the newly created nation state, young King Otto, as the Greeks would call him, Othon. Adam's statement may be one of the earliest instances on record of the weather as a recommendation in favour of tourism at Greece at specific times of the year. Gell was not quite correct when he asserted that Scott's insistent desire to return home to Abbotsford got the better of any wish to see Rhodes, for it transpires that there was still another reason why Scott did not in the end go to mainland Greece or even sail the Aegean, that of course is Rhodes. This was the strangely prosaic, prosaic one of travel insurance. Scott's lawyer, John Gibson, had got wind of the proposed visit to Corfu and the possible extension of that voyage to the Aegean, and had sought permission from the companies with which Scott's life was insured. Objections were fully expected from one life office in particular, should Scott venture any further than Naples. Having informed Robert Caddell that there might be problems of this nature, Scott assured him that he would be prudent if he were to find himself able to go to Greece. I do not intend to travel, but merely to look ashore at some remarkable places I can see from the sea. Do not fear, I shall keep myself out of all scrapes, and if the affairs of Greek mend, for at the present they look gloomy, I shall come home by some other method. And this is Scott's original insurance policy, with a rather lovely device at the top, which shows the vignette of Edinburgh Castle, the sort of old reeky face of Edinburgh, above a Greek Doric portico representing, I think, the, the modern Athenian face of Edinburgh. Various factors coalesced to prevent Scott's plans from coming to maturity. Sir Frederick Adams' time to mind turned to his next posting in India. The Admiralty never provided the frigate that had been so much talked about. Abbotsford did indeed exert its siren call. Scott's time in the Mediterranean thus ended on a strangely subfusque, unromantic pedestrian note foreshadowing an almost Victorian world of insurance policies and risk when a sick old man, but one nevertheless with a late in life wish to see more of the world, specifically Greece and the Aegean, came up against a careful Edinburgh solicitor raising mundane issues of prudence and precaution. If one seeks for an absolute definitive end to the old tradition of the Grand Tour as an institution in which the acquisition of culture was mixed with the pursuit of adventure and its multifarious inherent dangers. Maybe this episode supplies it. On the 15th of April, 1832, Scott noted in the last of his periodic, periodic entries in his journal while in Naples that we start tomorrow morning for Rome, after which we shall be homeward steering for the Greek scheme is blown up. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And my, my COVID afflictions would apologise.
otherwise it's effectively. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we can do questions. Yeah. I'm sorry. I really do. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, before we um, say thank you again to, to Ian, I'd like to call um, Louise Gardner to the front, if you're uh, who's going to offer a vote of thanks. Um, with the intention that if you wish to catch Ian for a, a question, uh, perhaps do so when he's had a glass of wine and uh, a little bit refreshed. Yes. Well, that was a wonderfully interesting talk. Thank you so much, particularly as you're obviously not feeling 100%. But um, I have been coming to these talks here for quite a number of years now, and I have always wondered how one man can be the cause of us to talk about such an enormous range of subjects. I mean, he had a fantastic range of interests, of achievements, and it could be either tree planting and land management, or it could be song and poetry, or it could be romance or chivalry, or it could be the countryside of the highlands or the borders or even the Northern Isles. Um, mostly these are features of Walter Scott where he was really, really strong. You have now taken a completely different approach. You have gone for something where he started with a decided weakness and you have explored that. And that too is an approach that has been extraordinarily interesting to follow. So thank you for doing that and showing us the development from his disinterest and as a boy, obviously not a good ability to learn Greek, then denying that he was interested. But of course, being Walter Scott, he couldn't not be interested in Greece and the Greeks and the Greek language and poetry and writing and art for the rest of his life. It was just not possible. It was all around him, even here in Edinburgh. And so he would become interested. And so thank you for guiding us along that route. It has been a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. So um, Ian assures me that he's brought copies of both books with him, uh, and so you could cross his palm with silver and uh, make yourself very happy over special the winter. Special price tonight. Yeah. Oh, coming. yeah, he'll give you a special price. Um, um, and possibly two for one? No, no, I can't do that. Um, <laughs> no, before we, uh, before we say cheerio for, for the year, because this is our last time meeting in 2022, um, I just thought I might um, mention some of the things that will be going on in 2023, just so that you can get excited about those because um, I see we've ended on quite a high. Um, March, we're going to hear from um, Chris Agnew and uh, Gillian Black about uh, Scott's coat of arms. Uh, they did some work on the supporters in particular um, in 2020. Um, in April, we're going to hear from Joyce Kaplan on the Heart of Midlothian. Um, in May, we'll be welcoming uh, Dr. Janina Ramirez, who's our current president, to our annual dinner. And then in June, following our AGM, uh, we'll have Hilary uh, Clydesdale, uh, I think, presenting some fresh perspectives on Red Gauntlet, um, which will be fascinating. Um, so we've got that all to look forward to, but uh, perhaps more pressing is looking forward to a drink. So thanks once again to Ian, and uh, have a splendid break. Cheerio.